Welcome back. You're still watching World Insight with me, Tianwei. The program coming to you Monday to Friday on CGTN. This week, we bring you our special series of interviews, Women on Top. The first is Harriet Four, the Under Secretary General of the United Nations, who's also the UNICEF Executive Director. UNICEF is working to provide urgent assistance to children affected by violence in Syria, including millions of children, refugees driven out of their country. Who better to ask about these efforts than Harriet Four? She just took office as UNICEF chief this year. For more than four decades, she has championed economic development, education, humanitarian assistance, and disaster relief in both public service and the private sector. Take a look. The wars that is going on around the world, may I say particularly in Syria, the fate of the children there, focus of the world attention. What can UNICEF do? Can you really save lives? Can you really help those people out of the devastating situation? Chen Wei, yes, we can. So UNICEF can be there before, during, and after those emergencies. Are you there? Yes, we are. So in this particular case, in Syria, we have people in Syria. As you know, the violence, the displacement is in so many parts of Syria. So having staff in each town with internally displaced people centers, so getting them water, mm. blankets, food, health supplies, hygiene kits, it's so basic and yet if you have to leave and run away from your home, what you need is you need to be clean, you need to have water, right. you need your family. We also try to make sure that you're connected to your family, so sometimes families get split up in times of violence. So they are running, especially young children, in different directions. So we try to give them um, name bands mm -hmm. so that we don't lose them, so that we know where they're from. Sometimes in the trauma, they can forget what village they're exactly. from, their own name, the name of their parents, and yet we don't want them to lose their identity and their families. So we help with that. We also help when they cross the border. So when they're refugees out of Syria, they go into Lebanon or Jordan or Turkey or Iraq, we help with making sure that there are schools. Mm. So the, let's say the Lebanese school system, they now are running a shift for Lebanese children and a shift for Syrian children. So the teachers work extra but we are trying to get them into a school system so that they can learn how to read and to write. Because with the, the violence going on for five years, a young child can miss learning how to read and write. And if that happens in a number of places around the world, it's true in South Sudan, it's true in many yes. other places, your concern is the concern that we feel, the urgency that we feel. But ED4, as you may know, many of these children, they do not have necessarily a family connection, which means these children have to act alone. And therefore, many of the supplies that you're talking about, many of the opportunities that you're talking about, these children might not have enough strength to grab them. Yes. So how to make sure that those children are having the real opportunity and equal opportunity with those children that are having families? Yes, 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 you're exactly right. And so that's part of the puzzle of working with children. Children have to feel safe. Yes. They have to feel protected. They're the weakest party. Yes, they are, and they're the most affected by all of this violence. Mm -hmm. So if we can create child-friendly places and places of rest where they can just pause in terms of uh, everything around them falling apart, mm -hmm. that helps. And then if we can get protection services, because as you know, if you're a young person, you're alone, you're very vulnerable. Yes. You're vulnerable to groups that might want to grab you for their Whatever militia reason. Yes. or for other purposes, trafficking in, in young people. So having safe places for children is very much part of our duty and our responsibility worldwide. But besides that, what else can UNICEF do? Can you call on governments from around the world, ask them to look at their own plans, look at how they are dealing with Syria, to ask both sides in Syria about their plans for the future of the country, look at what they are doing to the children in, on the ground. Can you do that as well? Yes. So Tianwei, just as you use your voice to speak out on behalf of all of us, 
So UNICEF uses its voice worldwide for children. What is the latest try about Syria, for example? So we are asking that there be no more violence, that there be access, humanitarian access, into every community. Every single individual, particularly the children, should have the ability to have food, yes. to have water, to have hygiene, and have a chance to... Like, education. are you being listened? One's never listened to enough. We do not have enough access. There is not enough sense by the world community of uh, responsibility for these many young lives. But we talk with, uni with uh, governments all over the world. Mm. We work in 190 countries. Some governments, at some times in their, in their electoral cycle, feel very strongly about the role of women and children. And they take it to heart. They create excellent primary school systems, excellent early childhood development systems, newborn survival, secondary education. Right. At other times, governments do not listen to us. But that's when you need the people to say, children are the most important opportunity we have. Let's look after them primary. <laughs>
I think it would change uh, not only how the projects are accepted by communities, but also how the experiences of China mm. and the international world intersect. So, for example, if you're putting in a road, along that road, you would want a school, you'd want a health clinic, you'd like to work with the community, you'd like to work with the young people so that they can maintain that road. Mm -hmm. So there are many possibilities for employment and activities. We also want to think about what are the skills for the future. So this group of young people, we are inviting um, on behalf of the United Nations and the Secretary General, China to join for a young people's agenda. Mm -hmm. And if so, what are the life skills that you'll need as a young person? So if you're between the ages of 10 and 18, what are you learning exactly. that you're going to need for the future? And, and I think that will be an important area of activity. China has so many interesting models and examples to share with the world that we would like to be partners. About the Belt and Road that you mentioned, it is still a plan. And it's a plan that China plays a leading role in coming to the design, but also it is inviting all the partnerships along the Belt and Road Initiative. How will that eventually come to be realized? And to what degree, eventually about what, is still a very open discussion. So ED4, in this regard, how will the children's cause be integrated into the overall plan? Yes, good. So Tianwei, you're on to the most important operational point. So UNICEF's strength is our people and our programs on the ground. We've been around for 70 years. So all along the Belt Road, in every one of those countries, we will have people and programs that have been there for years. So just as we do in China, working with education ministry or health ministry, working with local and regional governments, we are in each of those countries. So as the Belt Road Initiative moves into each country, we are already there on the ground to be the liaison with the local government to shape the programs because much of it is related to having um, ownership at the country level for let's say their early childhood development, their own primary school education, their national development plan. So UNICEF helps to shape that with a partner on the ground. Mm -hmm. We work with each of the ministries. We work with the local communities so that there is a sense of understanding about best practices, but there's also a commitment mm -hmm. that parents have with children, that regional governments and national governments have with their citizens. And that becomes the strength of the network for Belt and Road. But at the same time, ED4, you may be very well aware that the Belt and Road Initiative, after China has put forward this proposal, there are a lot of debates going on in the world. More than 80 of them, countries and organizations, have been supporting of this initiative and they want to actively play a role. Uh, others are still pondering. There's different opinions too from other countries. So how do you as UNICEF, which is an international organization, it is within the UN system, work with this idea and work with this proposal and develop it? So we, are, we feel that children are central. So Children cannot wait. This is the time to act. And so, as a result, we are impartial. We work with everyone. Those rhetorical debates does not help with the fate of the children, does it? <laughs> no, it does not. And at least for us, we are, we are the neutral, safe, um, impartial, knowledgeable partner. So we work with everyone. So if, if a country is interested in their children, we're there to help. As simple as that. Yes. Exactly. But on the other hand, the ED4, China is still fighting with its own problems. Some of them are gigantic problems in its own sake. For example, uh, poverty alleviation. Uh, China has been planning to eliminate extreme poverty in three years' time. That's going to be a daunting tax if you know the exact number. So how do you think UNICEF can work with China on those important causes once China's problem is being solved, it is a big contribution to the world solving an ultimate question. Yes, exactly. So let us say that the 32 to 34 million individuals in China who are below the poverty line, how do we reach them? We have a number of programs that we're doing jointly in 
China with a number of ministries, Ministry of Health, with MOFCOM, etc. The problem of stopping poverty into the next generation, mm -hmm. because if you can, if you can alleviate poverty in one generation, particularly among women, they will pass on good practices. Then the children of that generation will be healthier. They will be better educated. So there are many benefits to eradicating poverty, and the lessons of China are extremely important. That we would work both in the western areas of China, mm -hmm. which are many of the most vulnerable populations and the hardest to reach, to try to help those numbers. Because when China reaches um, its uh, uh, important goals, then the world under the Sustainable Development Goals will have a chance to reach its Sustainable Development Goals. Mm -hmm.